Hey, this is the Nate Jamar Rickworth. And believe it or not, whether you like it or don't like it, learn to love it. Because you have to listen to Wrestling Is Real. It is the best thing going today. Woo! The worldwide leader of podcasting excellence. The king of podcasts radio network proudly presents The Wrestling Is Real Podcast. Because wrestling needs us. King of Podcast here with you, Nass, Rick Flair, who you hear at the top of every show now, was at Dynamite tonight in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. As part of a really packed card they had on the show, a lot of things being set up for full gear, another double shot with MGF, defending the tag team titles for Ring of Honor, and the AEW World Heavyweight title, same night. Wow. A lot of stuff going on with that. And then along with that with Dynamite, the setup with the Don Callis family, the House of Black, knowing what they're doing in collision and what they did all this past Saturday, a setup for MGF and Kenny Omega for the World Heavyweight title at collision this Saturday. Wow. And so much more. I mean, it's a pretty crazy card of wrestling going on this weekend, as always, going up against football. Saturday, NWA Sowen coming up in Cleveland. One of the areas we have to go and talk about in the program about NWA and TNA. We got to talk about the fallout from bound for glory. The fact that TNA total nonstop action wrestling is once again, going to be the name of impact wrestling into 2024, beginning at hard to kill January 13th. That's a lot going on in wrestling for what coming into November. This is usually the off season. And meanwhile, WWE is chugging along and they're going to be doing some things that are really going to be very strategic on behalf of TKO group holdings. Now we talked about last year or th- earlier this year, all the different shows he did outside. Let's say since SummerSlam of last year, remember they did clash at the castle, Cardiff, Wales. They did Saudi Arabia. They've done backlash in Puerto Rico this year. And then Money in the Bank in London. And they're going to continue to doing more when it comes to global events. And that's one of the theories we got to talk about. It's the real growth of wrestling. When I talked about a boom last week, how can you deny that there is not a wrestling boom right now? When you look at what they're doing, it feels like every company is now trying to step it up. AEW did have their show in London this year. They're going to go back next year. Do they go for another big show next year? I mean, we know there's been some talk and flack about, well, Sting was out there for his retirement speech or just about the announce his retirement. And yeah, the crowd outside of Houston, Texas, they were able to catch quite an amount of empty seats out there. Okay. But of course, the... WWE bubble fans that can't help themselves, but bash AEW every chance they get. Now, I don't know how many AEW fans are also going the other way around, but either way, I don't condone, nor do I care about the petty squabbling among fans on Twitter or TikTok. I just could care less around doing this show. I mean, I've been doing this show since 2012. Okay. It's going to be 11 years doing the program coming up in December. 805 shows in. I just don't care. I and I know a lot of podcasts out there, they enjoy the petty squabbling. They enjoy the little back and forth of other shows, and they enjoy this little intrigue um, of trying to create some kind of a Monday Night War scenario like it was before. It's just petty. It's punching down for WWE fans. I've said that already many times before. I will say it again. But I will say this too. The fact that TNA has come back as a brand, I honestly think it's going to be even a bigger deal than you can imagine. Okay. Now, Impact Wrestling itself is a brand in 2023. They're going to London. They're going to the UK now to tour. And we're going to have shows going on from over there. Big, hot crowds going on before they make themselves back to the US and they get ready for Hard to Kill. It's a lot. One of the things I wanted to look at is what I talked about. What is going to happen to the actual show going into 2024? I asked, would there be a six-sided ring again? Will they bring that back? 
it's synonymous with TNA. Everybody knows what it is. Could they bring that back? The other thing is, do they have the dual entrances for the impact zone? Do they give us that impact zone feel back once again? And are going to be some matches like, will the King of the Mountain match be much, something much more prominent and consistent? And what else will TNA do to latch back to tradition? Because one of the things they can do by having the TNA brand coming back is for any of the stars that are looking at, well, do we want to bounce from the WWE to AEW or the other way around? Or does TNA become a brand that gets noticed again? Think about it like this. So when you look at some of the stars that were TNA originals that are on various shows right now, okay, if contracts were to come up and expire, there's a number of names from TNA over the years that could always opt to go back to TNA and be a part of that brand again. Now, there aren't even a number of stars that have done that already, but think about that. And if it's not that, if AEW doesn't feel like the other spot to go to because of the fact that there's so much still crowded of a roster over there, you're not just going to impact wrestling anymore, which is a respectable wrestling brand. Respectable. Listen, not everyone goes there because impact wrestling as a name has been basically what's been used as part of the rebuild of the brand to get it back to a respectable level. And to the credit of Scott Damore and Ed Norholm, they did it. Everything from top to bottom of that brand, except for some of the things they do that are a little bit hokey, like the Joe Hendry's and the stuff they do with the realm and things like that. I mean, that's part of what their thing is. I mean, NWA also has that part too, a little bit of shtick. Right? Johnny Swinger, you know, Santino Morella, all that is kind of sticky. And I'm like, I'm not really much into that. It's like, it's there. But in the serious part, Impact Wrestling now transitioning to TNA is a very strong roster, still held up by the likes of Josh Alexander and the Motor City Machine Guns as individual champions, Chris Saban retaining the X Division title, Alex Shelley retaining the World Heavyweight title. You still got the Rascals on that roster. I mentioned Josh Alexander. You still got Moose. You got ABC. I mean, you got a lot of star power over there. There is quite a bit of star power in that. I mean, not star power in the point of what the other companies are doing, but like they have some prominent stars that are noticeable and recognizable, and they do really well. PCO being re-signed, pretty important deal. They're not short on that. And they are one of the few companies that will still kind of attach themselves to the ECW stuff when it comes to Bully Ray and Tommy Dreamer and Rhino, right? But TNA could do something where they have to look at what has always been the standouts of that company going back. TNA's always been the home of young stars on the come up. They have quite a few of those still on that roster now. There could be much more that could come into that way. Noticing what the TNA brand represented, you know, that 60 minute adrenaline rush and the stars you would bring in young, fresh, hungry. This speedball Mike Melly is another great example. Steve Macklin is another great example. You just look at who they have. And then that's the men's division. Then the women, you got the knockout division, which is, I mean, compared to any, any other roster out there, when you got the likes of, Trinity and Jordan Grace, Deanna Parazzo. Exhibition title has been there, but obviously with the roster they've had has been a little bit limited. They always have only a certain amount of people on that roster they can regularly put into the X Division title picture. And that's part of the things they don't have they don't have so much of. But they make up for, like I said, quite a few heavyweights. And a very strong knockouts division, almost consistently as such. They were talking about adding more people to the roster, adding more to the production value. So they're going to be able to make changes in the production value. They're going to be able to have more where they could do an aggressive growth as a TNA brand. And what's going to happen is I think 
more wrestlers are going to be much more interested in working in TNA because of the capital, because of the intellectual property that TNA has. As Scott Demore mentioned at the end of Bound for Glory, the TNA name never went away. As Scott Demore specifically said, yeah, this is not going away. You keep chanting TNA, so now you're going to get to chant TNA all you want. And they're right about that. And it's good for them to go and do as such. So I'm glad they decided to go this route. This decision was so wonderful going to TNA. And I think now they can pick off some select names that might fall through the cracks of leaving the WWE or AEW. There's a number of names I can think of that could make their way into TNA and a chance to go ahead and get noticed because enough hardcore wrestling fans will pay attention to TNA now and they'll go looking out for it just because of the name. Just because we're bringing back TNA Impact. It's like as if it's 2016 over again, or yeah, 2015, 2016 over again, and it's as if TNA never went away. Because TNA will still be a name that'll be synonymous with, I mean, everything that was good when it comes to AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, Christopher Daniels. All those great tag teams to the bad stuff that came out, the main event mafia, aces and eights, <laughs> you know, I mean, stuff like that. So it is all made that way. And I like, listen, it's fine. Let's get TNA back to where it was. People are going to be all into it. I think also getting out of the blue and black or the green and black, whatever scheme they've had for the show to get it back into the old TNA look. To resurrect the original TNA, TNA logo, yellow and red, I love it. I love it, so I'm glad to see that back. I just like the whole idea. But most important, I know, for Scott Demore, and I'm sure everybody else sees that, is they want to be able to build that brand up, but without the stigma that comes with the past of TNA. They want to build that brand for the future, and make it where it is without a doubt a brand that will no longer have to be synonymous with some of the shit we had when maybe Eric Bischoff or Vince Russo or others held the pen. I mean, not everything was great over there, but what they're doing right now is pretty well set. So I don't have a problem with that. I think what they're doing right now is a very smart move. If you watch Impact Wrestling enough, you realize this company has been doing a very sound job. Like, to build themselves back up, to be able to go and make a consistent 100,000 viewer following on Thursday nights and putting out consistent content. They also survived the pandemic and also had to go through a lot of things to get their audience back and go through multiple TV channel changes, multiple night changes, just to get back to where they are. They're back on a good night, Thursday nights. They're all alone, standalone, and they're consistent. Now, as for TNA, I mean, for NWA, what night are they going to be on? I'm curious what, what night they can actually put NWA power. If they're going to put it on, what night is it for them? Do they hold it to the weekends? I mean, do they put it on Saturday nights? I mean, the problem is there's just not any nights left except for Sundays. No matter what, NWA Power is going to have to go up against somebody. Is it an hour-long show or did they get two hours? And if it's an hour-long show, like, where do you put them? What night did they go on? What night did they air? Hey, I'm just glad that CW Network is going to be having them on. Let's see if they're going to have the CW Network is going to be able to do some streaming for them as well. And the exposures are going to work out for them. Like, I want to see that. Can they get it to where they need it to be? The other thing that NWA is doing great in anticipation of this new TV deal is how they're going to basically take the territory system as their developmental. So Billy Corgan working with other companies. So with EC3's promotion, being able to go ahead and pick on a couple of choice names they find at these shows. And let's see if they can get somebody on board where they can really do something with 
finding a number of names that are possible that will work on the NWA roster coming in and out and become permanent members of the roster, finding some good young raw talent. And we'll see what they have in terms of who they bring over that'll be able to go ahead and work on the card for these shows. Now, when it comes down to it, there's quite a few stars they have right now in NWA. A lot of younger stars that really got pushed up to the top at NWA 75 with Kenzie Page and Colby Carino, among others. So, Solace Mason also in that mix. Like, that's the thing. These are all three champions right now on the NWA card. EC3, a relatively still, I mean, relatively in his prime champion. You know, people were complaining much about uh, Tyrus being with that belt and really couldn't move as much as he could anymore. Already in his 50s. I mean, at some point, he was not going to be able to hold that belt and work the matches as a champion. He can still cut promos, but he cannot work those matches the championship caliber matches that were necessary in NWA to really hold up. And God bless EC3 for being getting the most out of he could out of the championship, championship match that he had with Tyrus in the bull row match, but he did it. They got it done. And now we move along to Sowen and EC3 will take on Tom Latimer culminating in a long-term storyline with going back to control your narrative where CYN came into the space and started attacking Tom Latimer to make him part of the group. And now, full circle, we're here. EC3 is the champion. Tom Latimer wants to be champion. We'll have Camille in his corner. Kenzie Page will defend the Women's World title. Silas Mason will defend the National Heavyweight title. And Colby Carino will defend the Junior Heavyweight title, among others. And the Women's Tag Team title is pretty empowered. We'll also defend their titles. All titles up on the line. That's good stuff there, too. And so everything so far for NWA, they have quite a few people on their roster now and quite a lot of names that are synonymous with the roster, okay? When you look at, you know, they have names that are synonymous that you know only from NWA for the most part. Natalia Markova and the Southern Six with Kerry Morton and Alex Taylor, Samantha Starr, Missa Kate, Daisy Killen Talos, J.R. Kratos and Odinson, Max the Impaler and Judas, you know, all of that. Those are all names. Jack Stain, all more or less synonymous with NWA for the for a long run in the company and, you know, predominantly on that roster. So they have a really solid card this weekend. They're going to have coming up on Saturday. I don't know what I'm going to be able to do if I'm going to be able to go and cover this on Saturday night. I mean, I could because football is kind of like worked this way so I can take care of it because tomorrow night is the Bucks taking on the Bills, Thursday night football. FAU plays on Friday night. So football on the weekend will be kind of like I'm watching, but like if I got wrestling on Saturday night, I can watch. So I can watch Salwin and Collision on Saturday night and somehow make both of those watch possible. Now, It's all good anticipation to significant events for TNA and NWA leading into next year. Because at this point, we move into 2024. TNA rebranding. And then seeing NWA get on television. Those are major stories right there. It's major news across the board. So let's get into WWE right now and what they're doing leading up to Crown Jewel. And we'll also talk a little bit about what AW is doing right now leading up to Full Gear. So those are the next two pay-per-views for November with Crown Jewel coming up in two weeks. A week and a half. Let's make it more like a week and a half. But either which way, we'll do a, pro, we'll do a pre, pre-game a little bit for pre- Crown Jewel next week. And of course, I will be doing a post-show for Crown Jewel on that night, and of course, I think, what is it, like noon they start, or 1 o'clock they start for that night. And so, I'm pretty sure I'll be able to go and do a post show for that show on November 4th. 
And then when Full Gear comes up November 18th, I'll be at the movie theater. I'll catch it. And I will do a post show after that, November 18th. And that's how we set it up. And when it comes to the rest of the year, then we have what? Survivor Series on my birthday, November 25th. So I'll probably be home for that and I'll catch it. And the next year we'll have a deadline show, but there's nothing that's really scheduled in December all together for anything. So like December is going to be just a quiet month and that's fine with me. The way they set that up. Oh, Ring of Honor Final Battle is December 15th. There's that as well. And actually, it looks like there's another pay-per-view coming up. I didn't realize it was coming up. This is new. Hold on. Do we have a pay-per-view that's scheduled? Really? It's December 30th. And it'll be a Long Island, New York, Nassau Coliseum, and it's AW World's End. And that is coming up Saturday, December 30th. That's the first I've heard about that. I didn't even realize that was going on. But they're setting that up. But that's the way everything ends up for 2023 itself. And we'll get to that point. And, you know, about a month or so from now, like, honestly, like, let's say after Survivor Series, most likely I'll be doing the best of, well, not best of, we'll just review 2023 in general, which has been a wild year in general. We'll talk about that. And we'll start doing, you know, our recap probably just after Survivor Series. That's the plan on that. So the WWE right now, the plan to go ahead and go more global. So we already know a number of things are doing it so far. Let's go into some of this. So some of the reports we have so far is that Paris, France now is being listed internally as the host city for next year's backlash. So backlash was held in May of last or this year. And this is going to be on top of the fact that Money the Bank, what, I guess is going back to London? I, don't, I forget where they're going to be holding it next year. If I'm looking at it, well, not that far ahead when I'm looking at the calendar, so I don't, really don't know yet. But Elimination Chamber will be in Optus Stadium in Perth, Western Australia in February. So that's the in-between between Royal Rumble and WrestleMania in Philadelphia. And let's not forget that the Royal Rumble next year will be January 27th. And it will be going to Tampa, by the way. That's what we're learning right now. It's a new part that has been said that WWE is receiving $500,000 for them to be able to go ahead and host WWE Royal Rumble 2024 on January 24th at Tropicana Field in St. Petersburg, Florida, just outside of Tampa. And the idea is that part of this is really going to happen from a local effort so that essentially the Tampa Bay Rays Major League Baseball team is looking to go ahead and set things up to get a new stadium built for them in that area. coming out of their tourist development tax. So he said there's that. And now we're learning that August 31st, so no clash at the castle next year. We will actually have WWE's bash in Berlin. And that'll be August 31st, 2024 at the Mercedes-Benz Arena in Berlin, Germany. So they're definitely taking themselves all over the, all over the world. So yeah, you're thinking about two shows in Saudi Arabia, they're going to hit Europe, what, twice with Berlin and France and Paris, France. Oh, that's going to be awesome. And then they'll have Australia. Like, that's a lot they're covering. They're covering a lot of ground. I'm quite impressed with that. And why are they doing all this? Well, and they can because, you know, the global branding of this works well just like with ufc they're not afraid of going to other areas so like going to saudi Arabia, it's already set up ufc will go to other countries no problem same thing will be applying here 
big ticket sales, big gates. Why not? Like, don't even just try to get, just think you just have to saturate the U.S. market with pay-per-views. When you're already going to be able to go ahead and handle working events ongoing around the states for Raw and SmackDown. But to really build that up, I mean, some of those marquee matches for some of the fans, they're not going to be able to watch it here unless they go to Royal Rumble or WrestleMania or Survivor Series or SummerSlam. Like, it looks like that basically the domestic shows will be the four main pay-per-views. But meanwhile, doing a show at like Dunkin' Donuts Arena in Providence or, you know, going to Pepsi Center or whatever it is in Denver, like only these like random places. They're not doing these just domestic pay-per-views anymore. If they're going to do it in the U.S., they're going to do it in big stadiums. And if I look at what they're doing right now, with what they're looking to go and do in terms of putting the shows in other places, I mean, I don't even know how big these stadiums are that they're going to be setting up at. But now, off the stadium, the stadium is big. It is a multi-purpose stadium, and I'll forget what they use over here in terms of what kind of sports they have. They have a number. Oh, they do Fremantle. That's the football club. So Aussie Rules Football is there, I think rugby and a few other things. And capacity is 60,000 plus. 65,000 rectangular or 70,000 concert. So 65,000 for that stadium right there for Optus Stadium. And then for Mercedes-Benz Arena in Germany, that arena hold 17,000. That's just a regular arena for that. But either which way in Berlin, what a place to go and be that. That's going to be really cool. But they're going for exotic locales. They're definitely going for outside the country for the bulk of all their shows that are not like the big five. Well, no, and Money in the Bank, I mean, is it scheduled for next year yet? Do we we already know where it's going to be at? Because I'm trying to figure that out too. Have they made the announcement? Was it going to go back to London or is that going to be somewhere else? I don't know yet. So here's what we know so far about that. Now, back in June, when the la- back in June when we had the last money in the bank, when we were being asked about what were going to happen to the 2024 and 2025 editions. Nothing's been confirmed. But nothing has been announced yet for that so far. But they could also go European again, just like before, if they want to go that route. So they're going with all this. They've announced these new events going on. And next year, if they're going to do other shows, the appeal will not be so much of the matches they put on the card. They can be exhibition matches for all we know, or just matches where like nobody loses a title. But here's the thing. If you're going to want to have Roman Reigns or Logan Paul or, you know, pick who else you have, John Cena coming back or whoever there might be that will have, they just can't put like Roman Reigns and the Usos and Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins. They just want to put these shows and just like run of the mill arenas. That's for Raw and SmackDown. Those are TV shows. But when they want to have them on pay-per-view and you're going to get big ticket sales and you want to make sure those matches are marquee matches that WWE is just choosing, they're opting for those B-level pay-per-views, they're going to put them in bigger locales like they did last year, a number that what they already did. And now they're just going to expand on it. The fact they want to have Bash in Berlin, Backlash, Money in the Bank most likely, and Elimination Chamber all together. Like they really have put themselves out to make sure that the B level pay per views, they're not going to be pushovers. Not at all. They want to make sure they're put in big, legitimate venues. It's just the way they want it. Now, if they're going to do it domestically, I, I would still like to see that they'll still go back to Las Vegas. Like I, I haven't seen them put a Las Vegas show yet. And I think they need to go back to Las Vegas. They should still be able to go back to Legion Stadium because that is. I mean, come on. I would imagine that for TKO Properties, TKO Group, they want to be able to have at least one show of theirs that's not just UFC. They should put a 
a WWE live event, a premium live event in Vegas because it's just a spot to be. Obviously, UFC is you know, synonymous with it that the WWE needs to be able to do the same thing too. Work Vegas. Unless there's something that's going on where they can't do it, they should be able to go back to Vegas again. And I hope they'll be able to do that somewhere, somehow. What a locale to go ahead and have an event. Now, when we talked earlier about potential stars that could be making it over to other brands, let me put it like this. Now, this is a stretch. But there's word about Drew McIntyre's contract that has yet to be signed, that he has not been re-signed with the company. Now, we already know that Drew McIntyre will take on Seth Rollins at Crown Jewel next Saturday. But there's been reports out there, I'm taking this from WrestlingNews.co, that earlier this year he took a hiatus from WrestleMania after WrestleMania 39 when he was reportedly frustrated with creative and talks for a new deal that expires next year. He returned, though, at Money in the Bank. And on Wrestling Observer Radio, Dave Mills and Brian Alvarez discussed his contract status. Brian Alvarez says, so is there anything new on Drew McIntyre? Is he re-signed? Do we know? Meltzer says, I could check, but I do not believe he's re-signed. And Alvarez says, because that's a pretty damn big match for a guy who was not re-signed. Meltzer, oh no, they are gonna they were going to push him. He saw through April. There's time. You can do whatever you want with him through April. So the deal is that his contract was expired at the end of the year, but because all the injury time accrued, it's April. So, I mean, they're not at a point where I would say it's dangerous or we're at a turning point or don't put the title on him, which we've done before. So... That means whatever injury time he's accrued, that means he's staying up to WrestleMania, no matter what. So if he does leave in April 2024, if that is the case, he doesn't necessarily have to go back to go to AEW if that's the option. Because he could very well go back to being Drew Galloway in TNA. It's not a stretch. You might think it's off, but you know what? This is somebody where Drew back at, I mean, Drew Galloway, or as Drew Galloway in TNA, he was significantly strong there. I mean, for a number of years, him, Bobby Lashley, Eli Drake, they all owe the resurrection of their careers from their time in TNA. Tell me I'm wrong. AJ Styles, for the fact he was able to come in there as he did, also was resurrected by the fact he was in TNA. Christian Cage, the the now, you know, revised and even more evil and scumbaggery version of Christian Cage, the instant classic. Remember, this character was already familiar to us in TNA. Okay? They all were. And so to see this all here, you have to say to yourself, that's a lot of good talent that came out of Impact Wrestling in some of their lean years. If things are getting better for them and TNA can get to a point where that is social property, okay, the, the, the library, they have their content. You know, who else comes in and says, oh, TNA Impact Wrestling? Who, which advertisers might come on board and might put a little more into the juice? Who knows? Who, who knows what else could happen to the show as a result of the name change? The name change is significant. I've been trying to think of there's anything where I could think of anything that went back to resorting to a previous name and having the effect like this. Like there's not a lot of examples like this where you go back to a name and it's synonymous. Like let me tell you like this. Great example would be like the say the NFL football franchise, the Cleveland Browns. Okay. Remember the Cleveland Browns, they moved the owner, Art Modell, moved the team. What was it? Uh, so it was the Baltimore Colts moving to Indianapolis. And then the Baltimore team moved to Cleveland, right? So the, the idea is that Cleveland had to go ahead and restart with a new team altogether. Because the idea is, what, what was it? Yeah. I forget how that all works, but the thing was that the Cleveland Browns had to become a team once again. Brand new franchise. But they still have the synonymous with what they were before. But they came back as a pseudo-expansion team, but with an existing, heralded intellectual property, a name such as the Cleveland Browns. 
So for fans to go back into a new stadium, fill it up, get back in the regalry of being Cleveland Browns fans, wasn't hard for them to get back to it. I can't think of another better example, but this the idea. To go back to an existing name was that was familiar for wrestling fans, they see TNA in town, man, they'll tell you what, they're going to think about it. Because Impact Wrestling never had the same thing. Like even Jeff Jarrett even made the point about that Impact Wrestling didn't have the same punch as TNA. And when Global Force Wrestling was trying to be in, integrated into TNA or Impact Wrestling and Jeff Jarrett, you know, had to go by the wayside, he was saying, well, maybe we don't have to do Global Force Wrestling. I'll just, you know, let's just combine together and let's just get TNA back on. But Anthem Entertainment chose not to do that. That's okay. So there was a thought about that. Could they do something like that or not? So Drew McIntyre could very well consider if he's looking at free agent options, if that's something where the company chooses, they're not going to re-sign him. I mean, it'd be a shame that he did. If they did not sign him. But we know that Drew McIntyre, his peak in the WWE, by the way, as a result, of him being in Drew, as Drew Galloway in, in TNA, let me just tell you this. You did not get this run of him as world heavyweight champion or as, as a universal champion like you did you know, previously to Roman Reigns, right? You don't get that. You don't get him in his battle with Brock Lesnar to win the title because he became champion and we got Angela and we got the whole deal with him. Like, he's living off the legacy of being the World Heavyweight Champion, right? Or the Universal Champion. So he got that. Like, that's his. But now what do you do next? Like, the idea is, okay, now we're looking at what else are you going to do with Drew McIntyre? You put him in and paired him with Sheamus, and then after that, what else is there from now? You're putting him with Seth Rollins as just a one-off. I mean, I don't expect him to be continuing to do a long feud with him right now. Drew McIntyre has not turned fate and not turned heel yet, which is what the one thing that everybody thinks he's going to do. I mean, they do need heels on that raw roster, but like they're not doing a whole lot with him. They're they're integrating him, and they put him into this Seth Rollins feud. But will he be around after that? Like Crown Jewel, are we going to get a couple of one offs where Drew McIntyre and Seth Rollins is a one off, and then the other match we have is LA Knight. And Roman Reigns is a one-off. Well, I said about this last week. Roman Reigns is not losing that belt at Crown Jewel. And Roman Reigns is going to be LA Knight. You want to try to bet against it? Come on. How much you got? How much you got? I'll take that bet. I'll take the bet that Roman Reigns will win. Can't change my mind. Pretty obvious. Everybody knows this. So while everybody knows the inevitable that Roman Reigns will retain, now it could be by plunder at the hands of the bloodline, sure. But really, you're building him up now to be in this top spot, to be a step away, three seconds away from undisputed universal champion. Do you honestly think that the WWE right now, they have enough invested in LA Knight to put the belt on him? Does anybody think that he's done enough in terms of building up a record of win losses of having standout promos, like promos that you remember. And it's like, you go back and listen to them again and again. I'm, I got to ask this. How many LA night promos have you heard that were like, man, I'll always remember this promo. How many do we have? How many do we have? MGF, the mid promo. MGF, the the promo against CM Punk, the promo against Samoa Joe, the promos like of whoever. His promos with Adam Cole. I mean, I'm just saying, main event level. Okay. What has been out there that's been like memorable and stand out with LA Knight? Listen, they people like him out there, okay? Good for them to go ahead and want to boost him up. But he has a ceiling and you have to understand that he has a ceiling. Okay. The highest he's going to get is in this chance to be the opponent. Okay. Not even a contender. He's just going to get a chance to go and take the shot here 
under some kind of idea that John Cena kind of coordinated him as the number one contender. Like, what did LA Knight do to earn this spot? Necessarily. He's getting the shot here. Okay. How good was that promo matchup with Roman Reigns? Nothing special to me. I thought Roman handled the night, handled everything well. Could they make LA Knight a joke on how they handled him? Remember, with WWE, when you have a match like this and Roman Reigns is this out of a star, this big of a champion, unformidable, unbeatable, over a thousand days as champion, three years plus, and you're telling me the LA Knight in a losing fashion is going to get some kind of a comeuppance or he's going to get a rub off of working with Roman Reigns. Be honest with me. So, I, mean, I mean, be honest with me. They didn't do a good job in what they could have done with the Miz and LA Knight in the first place. The first legitimate feud since Bray Wyatt that he had. So he beat the Miz. Okay. What did he do after that? The thing is, he hasn't had feuds with every major star on the roster. He never did. He did it in TNA and Impact Wrestling. And when they moved him up to try to become World Heavyweight Champion, he lost. Because even Impact Wrestling, whether it was Billy Corgan that was in control or it was still Jeff Jarrett or Rob Conway or whoever else was over there, Dutch Mantel, none of those people thought he was champion either. You know who he was champion? What? NWA Championship Wrestling from Hollywood, right? Is that where he was, was the champion at? Other than that, he's not World Championship material. Nothing against him. But he and his promos will channel to a time to listen to The Rock or Stone Cold Steve Austin. This is what it is. It's like a novelty act. But fans don't want to admit that. Older fans know. Meanwhile, the younger fans, they want to live that legacy through him. They want to be able to do the yeah chance. They want to go and be able to say his name and treat him like he's the rock or Stone Cold Steve Austin. Because he didn't get the chance. They were not old enough to be in the stands, to be a part of the Monday Night Wars, and to be in the stands to chant or say anything to Rock or Stone Cold or Triple H or wherever else. They all watched on the network, Peacock or the WWE Network proper, and they watched there. But can't blame the fans that want to be able to go and do something like that, have a Attitude Era feel or a throwback to the Attitude Era with LA Knight basically giving us the greatest hits of The Rock and Stone Cold. Okay, if you're happy with that, just admit it. I have. Because I can't take anything away from the fact that the company's going along and they're letting Eli Knight be basically Eli Drake. But they can't call him Eli Drake. They don't want to call him Eli Drake. But Eli Drake was better in NWA and Impact Wrestling. You tell me I'm wrong. Now, one of the other stars I rarely ever talk about at all, Gunther. Okay, he's about to go and reach a milestone as champion. He's been on the main roster since 2022. He was NXT UK champion for 871 days. Won at NXT TakeOver New York 2019. Lost to Ilya Dragunov at NXT TakeOver 36 in 2021. And by the way, Dragunov, being in this case now, the fact that Ilya Dragunov right now is the current NXT champion, you know, following after the fact that he is here and Dragunov in NXT for that case was made to be a big deal because of how well they treated him in NXT UK and when they would show him on NXT on a regular basis. Now coming in and Dragunov being NXT UK champion after the fact when Guthrie left to go to NXT proper. Well, now, since June of last year, Gunther's been Intercontinental Champion. 
He beat Shinsuke Nakamura for it. And Shinsuke Nakamura has not held the belt since. The only thing he's done necessarily is go after Seth Rollins in a program for the World Heavyweight title. And then Gunther beat Drew McIntyre and Sheamus in a WrestleMania 39 triple threat match. Meanwhile, Gunther has held the belt for a long time. He's already surpassed a Honky Tonk Man's record of 454 days. He did that. He's about to reach 500 days. Oh, he already has. So this is of three days ago. He became 500 days as Intercontinental Champion. But this is the problem. This is nothing against Gunther. Nothing against Gunther. Listen, Gunther is the real deal, legitimate, world of sport, catch as catch can. He is, you know, cut from the cloth of William Regal and Squire Dave Taylor. All right. He is a massive man with a great work rate, a great look. He's good. He doesn't even need Imperium. Let me just say that too. Gunther could go stand alone. He does not need Imperium. And people feel like good about having it. Eh, whatever. Giovanni Vinci, Ludwig Kaiser doesn't make a difference to me. They could just be a tag team for all I know, but they don't need to be attached to Gunther. Gunther could be standalone without anybody needing any help with him. But listen to the challenges he's had for the IC title so far. All right. You have Xavier Woods. Now, I mean, Xavier Woods never been really a serious contender as a single star, but like, listen, when he's not doing New Day with Kofi Kingston and he's not had Big E out there for a long time, and by the way, we still haven't seen from Big E yet if he's even coming back or not, but he's been around, but he has not been on, you know, he's not been active in the ring in a long time. Mustafa Ali, Bronson Reed, Tommaso Ciampa, Chad Gable, and others. But these are the people that he's had for the IC title. Like, what? We cared about the IC title when Gunther took on Sheamus, when he took on Drew, Drew McIntyre and Sheamus. Listen, those two matches right there, solid. Like, Gunther has been there and has done a lot for himself. It's great stuff, but, like, there's just so much more we could expect. Now, think about the fact of the U.S. title. And I just asked the question, you know, look at the same way you look at with Austin Theory and who he had to take on for his run as the United States champion before Rey Mysterio took the belt back, right? Think about it like this. In his run as United States champion, you're talking about all the stars he's had here. Here we go. First of all, second run as a U.S. champion. Let's just take the second run, not the first. The first would have been like, felt like Flash the Pan, right? Okay, all that stuff. But let's just take the fact that, you know, he did have it 75 days, the initial run, lost to Bobby Lashley, Money in the Bank, 2022. Now, he also had Seth Rollins he was taking on, Mustafa, Mustafa Ali, right? Among others that he had, challenging him. Balor also challenged him for the U.S. title. But let's look at the second run as champion now. Until he lost at payback, and his reign was 258 days. Just saying. Theory is champion through 2023. First off, it was Survivor Series War Games that he beat Rollins and Lashley in a triple threat to win the second time the title. Then he retained the title start of Raw this year against Seth Rollins, beat Lashley in a no DQ match, and two matches that he had with him. He defended the title in an elim- uh, by the way, he, he, the, the U.S. title was defended in an Elimination Chamber match. And remember who was in that match? Bronson Reed, Damian Priest, Johnny Gargano, Montez Ford, and Seth freaking Rollins. And then he retained the title against Edge. 
And then he challenged John Cena at WrestleMania 39. And Austin Theory beat John Cena. The difference between the belts. Austin Theory is still being booked strong. Now, since he's lost the belt, him being attached to Grayson Waller, I'm not necessarily caring about that. But listen, the run that he had as champion, he's a pretty legitimate star right now. He's one of the young stars that's being built strong on the SmackDown roster. And if you want to say who would be built strong on the Raw roster, Dominic Mysterio. They have some young stars, but like the way they build them up and what they're doing with them is a different story. Because with Austin Theory, he's built in the mold of a WWE superstar. He's maybe not a bigger WWE superstar, but he is in the mold that they want. Remember, they attached him with Vince McMahon. Obviously, he's got the chosen one kind of mystique with him anyway. Been a very good heel. His matches have been pretty good with all this going on. Now, with that said, and remember, look at the, with the title right now with the U.S. title, the importance of that. You know, it's one thing about the person that holds the belt, but it's also who you put up against that title holder. Because when it looks at the U.S. title, look at all those stars I made mention of. And now that Ray Mysterio is holding the belt, he's taking on Logan Paul at Crown Jewel. Like the U.S. title is made more important than the IC title. For Gunther, you know, the presence of him was just to make him where, okay, he's just going to steamroll everybody. And there's nobody in the mix right now that I believe they have set to go after Gunther and take the belt off of him. And do I see Gunther eventually after he drops the IC title after a long run? I mean, does that basically garner him the opportunity to go after the World Heavyweight title? I mean, would they ever consider Gunther taking on Roman Reigns for the Undisputed Universal title? Now, I'd love that match. I don't know how you'd get there, but if you just give me the match alone, I'd love it. I think that would be a great main event match. But this company's not going to do that. They never considered putting those two at odds. Nothing like that. I mean, you could. You want to do some a fresh storyline. Gunther, you put Imperium against the bloodline, and you get them at each other's throats. How about that? You might catch my attention there. But they never thought it to go that route. No. And like I said, when you look at the stars that Gunther's had to go after in recent K, recent days, Xavier Woods, Mustafa Ali, Bronson Reed, Tommaso Ciampa, Chad Gable. Like, there's, I mean, some of the stars he has in there. Like the IC title. I mean, if you want to have Sami Zayn or Kevin Owens or Jey Uso or I don't know. I mean, you have other stars that could have been going after that belt. If Cody wasn't going after the Universal title yet and has not gone after the... He never went after the um, World Heavyweight title. Then, I mean, could Cody want to just like collect gold and say, hey, I'll take on Gunther. You know, it's like as a step up. Like the IC title is not being used as a step up for them to get to a title shot to become the main event and be a world champion. The IC title was meant to be that, but right now the U.S. title is obviously being put more as a stepping stone. Meanwhile, I don't see that here when it comes to the IC title. Maybe I'm missing something, but that's one of the things I'm looking at for myself. So I don't know what to think about all that after the fact, but like I said, I just, I, I feel concerned of what they do with the title holders and what they're doing with their, with their titles, respectively. It's like Seth Rollins, so far as World Heavyweight Champion, you know, they've put some very credible opponents with him when it comes to Finn Balor. They had a great program with him. The Shisuke Nakamura program was fine. Nothing over the top, nothing overly special, but it was fine. And now Drew McIntyre's in a mix. But is it going to be a one-off? Is it going to be something more? Seth Rollins is being built up. But my thing is that, that with Seth Rollins, you know, they even had a mention where he mentioned Roman Reigns in, by name. And when I think about it, if you legitimately wanted to have other opponents for Roman Reigns, you can't do it because he's going to blow him up. Because they're not going to let Roman Reigns lose to Gunther or Seth Rollins. I mean, personally, I still think Seth Rollins or Cody Rhodes are two contenders that you could absolutely put into the mix with Roman Reigns if you needed to have Roman Reigns 
you know, go off to Hollywood and say, okay, I'm going to drop the belt now. You couldn't do wrong with Seth Rollins or Cody Rhodes. But what about those other holders, right? When Austin Theory held it to the belt or Gunther holding the IC title right now, do either one of those make you feel like they're world champion material? I mean, if Rey Mysterio had his match with uh, Santos Escobar and Santos Escobar beat Rey Mysterio and became U.S. champion, do you think he would be considered world title material? I don't see that yet. I don't see that yet. But we'll wait. Okay. So NWA Sound is this weekend. I'll do a little preview predictions real quickly just because it's for fun. I think EC3 will retain the World Heavyweight title over Tom Latimer. Kenzie Page will return re- retain the World he- Women's World title over Ruthie J. I take Silas Mason over Chris Adonis. Colby Carino over Joe Alonzo. I don't see there any title changes at all. I do think that Mike Knox and Trevor Murdoch will win the Knights of the Roundtable tables match over Blunt Force Trauma to retain the NWA World World Tag Team titles. I think Pretty Empowered will retain the Women's World Tag Team titles over Natalia Markova and Taylor Rising. I will take Blake Troop over Jack Stain in the submission match. Headbangers are back once again. I will take the Southern Six on the win there. I will take Samantha Starr to be number one contender for the NWA Women's title over Miss Kate, Tiffany Nieves, and Celeste. I think Rush Freeman will be losing the loser leads the NWA match over Brady Pierce. I think Jared Kratos and Otison will win the United States Tag Team titles. And the Ultimate Hardcore Tag Team War, I'm taking Max the Impaler. <laughs> Not even a question. There. I will take Max the Impaler for the win over the rest of uh, that and I forget what Father James Mitchell used to call that. The family, right? Yeah, it's not. Riddle box match, Brothers of Funstruction, Rofo the Clown, and Yabba the Clown against Valen J, La Rebellion, and Vampiro. I'll take Valen J, La Rebellion, or Vampiro in that match. And that's it. So we're going to see what happens then to Luis Alvin. If, if there's a way to have time and I can make time to go ahead and just do the show and I am able to go and catch it all like I hope for, then I'll see about doing a post show then and at least do some other things to follow along with what's going on with wrestling on Saturday night. So no promises, but maybe it'll happen. And then the other thing is next week, like I said, crown jewels coming up and I will do a post show for that. And of course, in a couple of weeks we'll have full gear and I will do a post show for that. You can, you can plan on those coming up. That's definitely that all expected. In the meantime, kingofpodcasts.com. That's where you find all my content. You'll find clips of the show all on my social media, Twitter, now X, Facebook, Friends, Instagram, LinkedIn, at King of Podcasts. Look for that. Come back for another Wrestling Podcast next week because wrestling needs us.